Another installment of the National Constitution Center's America's Town Hall. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this wonderful institution. Friends, those of you who have been with us before know that whenever we gather, we begin by inspiring ourselves uh, and reciting the mission of the National Constitution Center, which comes from Congress. And here goes, you can recite after me uh, in the comfort of your home. The National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to increase awareness and understanding of the Constitution among the American people. We have launched a series of exciting programs about the Constitution during this time of virtual learning. Uh, this Thursday, we have Rick Hassan and Ned Foley to discuss their new book about uh, the electoral system and presidential elections. Yuval Levin will join us on April 28th to discuss his new book on how to restore trust in America's institution. And we're scheduling a new program with Republican and Democratic state attorneys general to discuss the challenges that their states are facing in the wake of the COVID crisis. Uh, today, it's uh, a great pleasure to welcome you to a discussion of one of the most hotly contested questions in American constitutional uh, history and politics today, and that is the Electoral College. We have a wonderful array of panelists, and I'm going to introduce them now. Uh, Jesse Wegman is a member of the New York Times' editorial board and the author of a new book, Let the People Pick, The Case for Abolishing the Electoral College. Uh, I've read it, and I urge you to get it. We hosted a great debate with Jesse and Jim Caesar a few weeks ago, which you can find on our podcast series, and it is uh, one of the most powerful cases uh, for abolishing the Electoral College that you can find, and we're uh, very honored to have him. Uh, Amal Ahmed is Associate Professor of Political Science and Associate Provost for Equity and Inclusion at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She is the author of Democracy and the Politics of Electoral System Choice, Engineering Electoral Dominance, which won the Best Book Award from the European Politics and Society section of the American Political Science Association. And she has written about the Electoral College for uh, many outlets, including the American Prospect, and she has a great new essay uh, on it uh, coming out soon. And William Ewald is professor of law and philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania, an internationally recognized scholar in legal philosophy and comparative law, and America's leading expert on the constitutional vision and philosophy of James Wilson. James Wilson is a much neglected founder who has Bill will explain, was responsible more than anyone else for the idea that in America, we the people are sovereign rather than we the people of the uh, individual states or rather than the national government itself. And uh, Bill has written a very often cited article about the philosophical uh, foundations of Wilson's vision. And his articles include James Wilson and the Scottish Enlightenment and James Wilson and the drafting of the constitution. Uh, welcome uh, to Jesse and Ahmed and Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bill, let's begin with you, if we may. Tell us about James Wilson's vision for the presidency, because as you have taught us in your articles, it was Wilson who first proposed a single executive, a proposal that literally brought gasps of silence from the odd convention. Wilson initially championed a popularly elected president, uh, but in the face of resistance, it was he who brokered the compromise that became the Electoral College. So tell us about Wilson and how his vision of popular sovereignty ultimately led to the Electoral College. Good. Uh, thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, so Wilson, uh, let me take it chronologically. Uh, that at the very beginning of the convention, as you say, Wilson proposed a single executive. This is on June the 1st. He then says the election of the president that he favors the idea of a direct popular national election. That was all that was throughout the convention. That was his preferred background position. He basically got no takers. George Mason, who was one of the more democratic members of the uh, of the convention, said, you know, I'm interested in this idea, but I really don't see how practically you're going to make it work. It's a big country. The difficulties are formidable. 
So Wilson goes home, comes back the next day with a proposal for an indirect election of the president, which is often thought to be the forerunner of the Electoral College. I actually don't think that's quite right. Wilson's proposal the next day is indirect election by the people bypassing the states and bypassing Congress as well. His idea was you divide the states up into lots of equal sized districts, let the districts choose a representative, the representatives then come together, they pick the president. Okay, so he, he makes that proposal. It also doesn't go any place. There's no real reaction to it. Things go kind of to sleep for several weeks till the middle of July. Middle of July, Wilson now joined by Governor Morris, they pop up, they say we favor a direct popular election. Charles Pinckney objects, says I thought we shot that idea down long ago. A couple of days later, Morris again gives a long speech in favor of direct popular election. Wilson's quiet that day, then two rather obscure delegates, so it's Rufus King and, and kind of William Patterson, say let's have an indirect election that goes through the states, which with each state having a certain number of electoral votes. Yeah, that's rather different from Wilson's original proposal, but he makes sympathetic, sympathetic noises. Um, they kick things round and round and round for, for many weeks until September, when the electoral college that we all know is finally, uh, finally adopted. Now, along the way, Wilson, at one time or another, at least expresses sympathy for four different ideas. So there's direct popular election. That was clearly his own first choice, but nobody was taking him up on it except for a handful of others. Indirect popular election, indirect election via the states, and what we now know as the Electoral College. And at one point, he actually said, let's do a lottery. Huh. So four separate, four separate views. In the end, he was one of the chief people backing the final Electoral College, but it was not his first choice. Fascinating. Thank you so much for that concise and illuminating history. It's very interesting to learn that it was a compromise. And my goodness, a lottery is quite a vision of how flexible he was willing to get. And um, I will ask you, after we've heard from Jesse and Amel, uh, the obvious question of what Wilson would make of the electoral college system that we have today. But let's wait on that question uh, until we've put on the table the leading arguments for and against keeping the electoral college. Jesse, you give a marvelous history of the college in your book, and you talk about efforts to reform it. But I want to jump right into the substantive question about whether we should keep it. In your book, uh, uh, which uh, is called um, uh, Let the People Vote, uh, Let the People Pick the President, the case for abolishing the Electoral College, you have uh, two chapters on myths about the Electoral College. And they include the following. Myth one, the Electoral College forces candidates to campaign and win support all over the country. Myth two, I'm scrolling through the book, so I have to uh, 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 wait to, uh, myth two is the electoral college protects the smaller and more rural states. And the third myth out of the sixth, you know what it is, but our audience is breathless as I find it. Here it is, the electoral <laughs> college would work better if electors were allocated proportionally or by congressional districts. I'll stop there. I, 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 you know, we, we, there's a lot to say, but why don't you begin your intervention by telling us what the leading myths about the Electoral College are and why you think that they're wrong? Sure. Um, well, I, I, first, I would just want to say, Jeff, thank you so much to you and the team at uh, the National Constitution Center for um, holding this event. Uh, we're actually holding it on the day it was originally scheduled, which is a, <laughs> a rare thing in this uh, time in our history. Um, so I'm really just thrilled to be uh, joining you and, and speaking to uh, your wonderful audience and also to be joined by uh, such great scholars in Professors Ewald and Ahmed. Um, I uh, uh, 
uh, Professor Ewald in particular is the, uh, the nation's foremost scholar on James Wilson. And so I had a lot of opportunity and he, get, he was extremely generous with his time while I was working on the book uh, in sort of helping me understand James Wilson's importance uh, not just to the to the Electoral College, but to the design of our Constitution. He was really one of the most uh, important framers of all and has been virtually entirely forgotten uh, in favor of people like James Madison, uh, Alexander Hamilton and others. But I think it's uh, I think with Professor Ewald's work and hopefully some of my book, uh, we will help to restore him to his proper place uh, in the framers pantheon. Um, you know, I, I also would like to talk more about how we, um, I think a lot of misunderstandings that surround what the framers were trying to do as I think Professor Ewald uh, started to get into there. It's not as simple a story as, as we often hear, but uh, with regard to your questions around the myths, um, you know, this idea that they were attempting to ensure that the, you know, pre you know, presidents campaigned everywhere and paid attention to all of the country or that the small and rural states weren't ignored. You know, there, there's a lot of, these are somewhat anachronistic uh, <laughs> ideas. Um, you know, at the time that the candidate, at the time that the convention, uh, the constitutional convention happened and they, they created the, the constitution that we live with today, uh, there was no presidential campaigning. So that was, that just wasn't something the, the, uh, the, the uh, framers, the delegates to the convention were thinking of. Um, and in fact, as it functions today, the Electoral College does the opposite of encouraging candidates to campaign everywhere. In fact, because of what we call the winner take all rule, which is uh, what 48 of the states use to award their electors, meaning they give all of their electors to the candidate who wins the most votes in their state. Because of that rule, candidates of both parties can ignore uh, the vast majority of the citizens of this country because they live in what we call safe states, right? These are states where the outcome is clear in advance that one, one candidate or the other will win the most votes in that state uh, pretty much guaranteed. And therefore, there's no point in spending time or money or, or, or giving them attention because it's not going to change the outcome. All the electors are going to go to the person who wins the most votes. The only attention that anyone gets is in the battleground states. And that's a maybe half a dozen states in, a, in an election year. This year, I think six is probably around the right number. Um, it will probably be down to two or three by uh, October. And that means that only a tiny sliver of the electorate is actually relevant to the candidates of both parties. They steer all of their policy proposals, all of their attention, all of their advertising, all of their time to, the, to that sliver and ignore the rest of the country whose votes are essentially disregarded because we know the outcome in those states. Um, so I think, in fact, it's, it's the exact opposite of what people often think, which is the Electoral College right now, as it operates, incentivizes candidates to ignore small states, large states, medium states, all states that are not battleground states. And that really ties into that second myth, which is um, whether, you know, this idea that we all kind of, people just sort of say almost in, reflexively that, oh, well, the small states would be harmed. In fact, it's just not true. Small states right now are ignored and under a popular vote, small states would get more attention than they do right now under the Electoral College. The third myth, which has to do with other ways of awarding votes besides winner take all, which many people who agree that the Electoral College doesn't work well today, but aren't quite prepared to say, let's go all the way to a popular vote. These are ideas that that a lot of the people who say that um, think are good ideas, which is proportional awarding of electors or, or congressional district awarding of electors. I can talk more about that, but the short answer is neither of them uh, improves the situation uh, to a degree that I think is acceptable for a modern constitutional democracy. That's great. Thank you very much for such a concise uh, rundown of the th first of your three myths. We may uh, return to the second uh, set um, on the next round. But um, Amal, I'd love uh, you to share with our great audience the arguments in a paper that you have coming out called A Very Unpopular Argument, The Democratic Case for the Electoral College. And you argue against the familiar arguments that the, the possibility for discrepancy between the Electoral College and the popular vote reflects a fundamental flaw in the system itself. You say that the flaw results from an increase in geographic polarization and shifting party strategies. And this reflects the weakness of the parties and therefore efforts to repeal the Electoral College would be a technical fix to what you call a fundamental political problem. Please uh, tell us more about that really interesting argument in defense of the Electoral College. So I wanna say first that I am uh, sympathetic with many of the concerns that people have about the Electoral College. 
Um, but when I approach it, what I'm trying to understand are the discrepancies, which are by far the, the most notorious aspect of the Electoral College is that you can have discrepancies between the Electoral College outcome and the popular vote outcome. So on its face, I don't actually think this is as surprising as, as we might believe. The Electoral College um, is guided by federalist principles. And so it should not be a great surprise that it can depart from the national popular vote. Um, but what for me became the empirical puzzle is actually why doesn't this happen all the time? And I believe Jesse also notes this in his book that it's actually quite rare. We know that it's happened uh, four times in, in the history of presidential elections. Um, and th these are 1876, 1888, 2000, and 2016. So the pattern that jumped out to me initially was that we have four elections um, clustered in, in time, separated by about a century. So the question isn't, uh, for me, is the Electoral College fundamentally broken? If it were broken, then you'd see this happening all the time. Um, why doesn't it happen all the time? Why doesn't it happen half of the time? Why does it only happen when it happens? Um, so I began looking for some underlying patterns that might be driving this. And what I've really been focused on is understanding um, the combination of shifting political, shifting political geography and uh, shifting party strategies, especially. And what I've been looking at, I've started with 2000, 2016, especially. And um, what I've been looking at are shifting party strategies along the lines of urban versus rural electorates. And what I'm finding is really an exaggerated um, focus within the Democratic Party on urban areas and within the Republican Party on rural areas. And this is not new, but it's really spiked around these elections. And the reason that's significant for me is that, especially in, um, when, you, when you see shifting strategies along these lines, it's going to lead to some wasted votes. And I think this is happening, especially with the Democratic Party. An urban strategy is really hard to calibrate. And so that's why you see their outcomes really out of whack with what you'd expect. Um, now, what's the punchline to all of this is, uh, you know, I think what we're seeing within these parties are really narrowing coalitions. And that's what worries me more than anything. Um, the, the discrepancy that we're seeing is a byproduct of these narrowing coalitions. And for me, that's a sign of party weakness, that they're unable to broaden their coalitions um, more geographically, which essentially means that they're unable to bring in um, new partners into their coalitions. It's affecting the Democratic Party much more than the Republican, again, because an urban strategy is going to be much more difficult to calibrate. Um, and the punchline of all of this really is that a shift from the Electoral College to a popular vote is going to exacerbate the problem of party weakness. And so you may see a, a temporary remedy to this issue of discrepancies, but that's why I say it's essentially a technical fix to what is a fundamentally political problem. And it's likely to exacerbate the problem of party weakness. Fascinating, thank you very much for that insight, for noting that geographic uh, uh, self uh, sorting has led to polarization and that parties uh, by the Democrats emphasizing urban voters and Republicans rural ones would become weaker without the electoral college. Um, Bill, uh, Professor Ewald, you have heard these uh, important arguments on both sides and I need to ask you the question on everyone's mind, what would James Wilson think of the electoral college today? And this is far from an academic question because the Supreme Court has agreed to hear in May two cases involving the constitutionality of so-called faithless electorate laws. Uh, many states have adopted laws that forbid uh, electors from voting for candidates other than the ones they pledged to vote for when they were elected, and the court will decide that question. And justices who care about the original understanding of the Constitution may well be interested in Wilson's views. So what would he make of the Electoral College as it's developed and operating today? I think it's quite clear Wilson so for many of the founders, it's actually rather hard to say. I'm not quite sure, for example, what Madison or Edmund Randolph would have said. Wilson favored all along direct popular election of the president. He was consistent on that from the very beginning all the way through to the end. He made it clear, electoral college, indirect election, lotteries, those are all second best chances. So for Wilson, they, present system, short answer, he would hate it. 
and he would say abolish it, go to direct election. Now, the sort of interior details of the electoral college, like the faithless elector issue, uh, his first line would be, but you shouldn't have the electoral college in the first place. Second line on that specific question, I think would be, you ought to be trying to, to give the people a voice in the electoral college. Therefore, faithless electors, you should not welcome them. They are inserting their own view between the popular vote and the election of the president. And uh, as I say, if you ask about Madison, ask about the others, it's much less clear what they would say. Well, just that's a completely fascinating point that uh, Wilson, the proponent of direct democracy, would, as you just said, want the college to reflect the people's votes and not want them to second guess them. So, but but just one more beat on that. Did, were Madison and Hamilton more of the view that the electoral college should be wise solons exercising independent judgment that would check the passions of the mob and so forth? And could you make an originalist case for an electoral for retaining the electoral college? and striking down the faithless electoral uh, lecture laws on that grounds yes for some of the for some of the framers that was a primary consideration not necessarily the overriding consideration but they thought you need the real experts to come in and sift through the candidates and pick somebody sensible if you leave it up to the people they're going to do they're going to do something kind of they're going to do something that is regrettable. Absolutely fascinating. And, and friends who are listening, you, you heard it here first. For these Supreme Court cases, we're seeing a conflict between the views of the principal framer of the Electoral College, namely Wilson, and some of the less uh, democratically or popular sovereignty and crime framers like Madison and Hamilton, which should make the justices' job. Jeff, Jeff could, I, could I step please, in just with please, a response? Please, please, please step in entirely, Jesse, and I want to now set First, first, I want to say to our friends who are watching, this is wonderful. We have 34 amazing questions in the Q&A, and I'm going to try to get to some of them soon. I want to give Jesse and Amal a round to sum up their positions, and then I'll start asking your questions. But Jesse, you can respond to, about Wilson and then put on the table the rest of the myths in your book about the Electoral College and why you think it should not be retained today. Sure. And I just want to say, first of all, I really think the primary, I, I love talking about Wilson. I love talking about the framers. I learned so much in writing this book and in talking to scholars like Professor Ewald. I was embarrassed at how little I, I knew beforehand. Um, you know, I went to law school. I feel like I should know a lot of these things. Um, but I, I will say at the outset, I really think the primary issue is what's happening today and what the Electoral College impact on the country's politics and governance is today. Um, I think that's even more important than the stories of our founding um, because you know we live today <laughs> uh, and we can be guided by the ideas of the framers, but um, we are alive today and we need to deal with the problems we face today. And so, although I think I disagree with some of uh, Professor Ahmed's um, analysis, I, I very much value her focus on the way the college is functioning today and how it may or may not be contributing to broader problems in the in, in our politics and governance. So that that said, let me just go back for a minute um, to piggyback on what Professor Ewald was saying about the framers. I, I do think there is a lot of misunderstanding about what they were doing when they made an electoral college uh, and what they were hoping it would it would achieve. I think one background contextual point that really can't be uh, emphasized enough is everybody knew that George Washington was going to be the first president. Everybody sitting in that room, George Washington was in the room. He was the presiding officer, right? In that room, in the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787. They, they were sitting there, his presence alone really affected the nature and the tone of the debate because everyone knew he was gonna be the leader and nobody wanted to offend him or say anything that might uh, upset him. So the whole debate about what it would be like, what it would mean to choose a leader of the country was, was affected by that and by the fact that they knew whatever they chose, he was going to win, uh, as he in fact did under the Electoral College. So I think we, we may make a mistake in assuming too much about what the framers um, 
thought about this system. There's a lot of, um, I see in, in social media and a lot of sort of the common uh, discussions of the Electoral College, it's part of the framers' brilliant design for our system of government. In fact, they cobbled it together at the last minute in a side room of the convention hall, you know, four or five men, actually not including James Wilson at that point, um, but including several other of the top delegates. It was 364 words long, the longest provision by far in the Constitution. It was a complicated mess, <laughs> you know. Um, very quickly, the framers themselves started to see the flaws in it. And I just want to emphasize that too, because it's not like it's, you know, angry liberals in 2020 who are, who are talking about this. The framers themselves understood it. You know, the one piece of evidence that we have, really the best piece of evidence we have that the framers believed that this would be, as you described, Jeff, a sort of, um, you know, a body of wise men who would make a decision for an uh, unwashed electorate is Federalist number 68. That was written by Alexander Hamilton in the months after the, you know, the, the uh, Constitution is finished as it's going out to the states for ratification. The Federalist, Federalist number 68 is the one that says, it has all those famous quotes that we still cite today, which is, um, it will be, um, you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but entrusted to, you know, uh, um, men who are endowed with the requisite qualifications to make such a serious decision uh, on behalf of, of the people of the country. And, you know, that literally that language is still quoted today. And yet Hamilton himself didn't really believe it. And the way we know that is because Hamilton himself is writing private letters to James Wilson behind the scenes in the, in the months after the, uh, the, the constitution is ratified and we hold our first presidential election, which is late 1788 into 1789. After that first election, but before the electors cast their ballots, he writes a letter to Wilson basically acknowledging a fundamental flaw in the design of the college as it was created and, and adopted at the convention and saying, we basically need to like work behind the scenes to fix this. And the flaw was, the flaw that we now know was, was fixed uh, by the 12th amendment, which was every elector was to vote for two candidates and the a candidate who won the most votes would be uh, president and the candidate who won the second most votes would be vice president, right? So that wasn't taking into account the rise of political parties that happens just a few years later. It wasn't taking into account any of the sort of political realities that very quickly came to bear. And Adams in 1789, this is, you know, <laughs> this is months after he's written the, uh, the Federalist 68 that we're still quoting today. He's writing a letter saying, we need to, he says, we need to throw away votes in certain states throw away electoral votes in certain states in order to ensure uh, that G George Washington becomes president. He could see that there was all, there was immense opportunity for gaming the system uh, in that, it, that had been designed. Anti-federalists in particular, he thought, were going to try to monkey with the system to keep Washington from being president because they were very upset, obviously, at, at how the at, the, at the fact of a national constitution and a supreme national government. And they wanted to, um, basically throw a wrench into the works. And so Adams himself, I'm sorry, um, Alexander Hamilton himself uh, is saying basically, the system that we built is not going to operate the way we said it was gonna operate and we need to get behind the scenes and fix things you know, uh, ourselves. I mean, I just think it's really important to remember facts like that when we think about what were the framers actually trying to do and what did they succeed in doing. The system that they built is really not the system that we use today and it's not the system that they thought they were designing. Thank you very much for all that. Um, these questions are so good that I'm, and, and several of them are for, uh, for, for you, Professor Amel. So I'll, I'll just um, uh, raise some of them and, and then ask you to answer them uh, and then to make a, the best case in favor of retaining the Electoral College that you can. Meg Mott asked, would Professor Ahmed explain a bit more about how a change to the Electoral College is a technical fix and would not address fundamental problems with the parties? David Bernstein asks, regarding popular election weakening the coalition building and the party system, shouldn't parties exist to reflect the people's view and not the other way around? Um, Appelstein, Professor Ahmed, um, what is party weakness and why is it bad? So a little bit more about that part of the argument and then broaden it out to, to add any other defenses of retaining the Electoral College today that you'd like to put on the table. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I'll start with the questions about the popular vote, uh, because I think this is where I like to engage in a little, uh, not myth busting, but some, some correctives to how we imagine the popular vote, because there, I think there are a lot of 
hypothetical scenarios based on this imaginary of the popular vote. Uh, per, some rerunning the 2016 election as if the popular vote was going to stay in place. Um, and so here's one of my arguments that tends to be very unpopular, which is that there's nothing natural about the popular vote. Um, the popular vote as we see it is a function of where parties mobilize and where they, they focus on getting out the vote. So a lot of the arguments in favor of a popular vote is they, they are betting on the, the parties shifting their strategy in one direction and not another. I don't think that's in any way a guarantee. I think at the end of the day, parties want to win and resources are limited. So there are always going to be electors and, and citizens who get more attention and who will have more leverage over parties. You change the architecture of the system and you are going to get a different calculus, but those same calculations and strategies are going to function because parties want to win and, and candidates want to win. So I don't think you're going to eliminate that essential strategic dynamic. You'll get a different popular vote, but it's not going to be a, a universal strategy on the part of parties because those, you know, I think that is always going to be constrained by resources and opportunities. Um, another thing I wanted to say though, is, you know, in response to the issues on origins, um, we've talked a lot about origins and I really appreciate these discussions because I learn from them um, and I, I gain new understandings from them. But I think um, we do need to be careful in talking about origins that we are aware that you know, institutions change over time. So there is no doubt in my mind that the electoral college was put in place for elitist purposes. I think many of our institutions were put in place for elitist purposes because we were founded by wealthy white men. Um, but I don't think those, I think they, they serve many purposes and those things can change over time. Um, so I think one of the things that often gets lost in the mix is that the electoral college preserves um, some federal element to the election of the president. And that is a valuable thing. The design of the system is meant to assess winning ability in different contexts. And at the time of the founding, the states were the relevant context for many reasons related to the, the importance of states for political identity. I think they still serve an important function in how we govern. The Electoral College helps to ensure that um, the winning candidate is more like it has, has a chance of being able to form a governing coalition, understanding that states still very much play a role in, in governing even at the national level. Thank you Jeff, very much. Could I, could I, could I respond? Uh, sure. Um, so I, I completely agree with Professor Ahmed that, um, that the, the fundamental facts about campaigns and, and, uh, and, and elections is that parties want to win and the candidates want to win and that they have limited resources. Absolutely agreed on that. I think where we may diverge is on what it would mean to change the rules of the game to a popular vote. I also agree with her that, you know, looking back at 2016 or any other election and saying, oh, well, Hillary Clinton really won because she won 3 million more popular votes in the country is somewhat of a a meaningless game because when you change the rules of the game, you change the players change their strategies. Uh, Donald Trump has, uh, you know, claimed repeatedly that were it to have been a national popular vote election, he would have won that one. And I, I'm not prepared to say I, I guarantee that he's wrong about that. Um, I think he probably is, but the point is, you know, parties are always adapting to the rules of the game. Um, but this is one of the reasons that I wrote the last chapter of my book, chapter nine, uh, in which I speak to experts from campaigns. These are campaign managers, field directors, ground game coordinators in getting out the vote um, from both parties uh, for the last 20 years or so of presidential elections. And I said to them, I asked them two simple questions. One, how did you win or how did you try to win under the Electoral College? And two, how would you have run your campaign differently had it been a national popular vote election? Because I figured, if we were going to think about what would be the impact on campaigning and on efforts, you know, governance strategies um, of switching to a different system for electing the president, who better to ask than the people who do this as a job? Almost to a person, they all preferred a popular vote election and said they would prefer a popular vote election. And that's because they understand this fundamental distortion that I've been talking about, which is that the electoral college under the winner take all rule as it operates today is, uh, 
focuses the candidate's attention on a very small number of states, and in some cases, even slivers of the electorates in those states, right? You know, only a few thousand votes gave Donald Trump the victory in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania in 2016. Uh, you know, that's all it took in a country of 130, 140 million voters to give him the presidency. And that just seems a, a fundamental distortion of representative democracy to me. And I think when you talk to these um, the, the campaign managers and the other experts on the who've run these campaigns, you find out that what we what we can see happening in elections that are sort of proxies for a popular vote right now, which are state governor elections or battleground state elections in the presidential race. These are elections in which every vote in the in the jurisdiction counts the same and the person who gets the most votes wins. You see that the candidates um, for for the office campaign all over the state. They don't ignore any part of the state because they know they need to win as many votes as possible. And even if they know they're not gonna win a particular region, say Democrats aren't gonna win uh, the countryside or Republicans aren't gonna win the city, they would like to lose by fewer votes because all of those votes matter. So they go everywhere and you can see this. It's not, I'm not theorizing here. You look at stra campaign strategies and where candidates devote their time and their money and their, and their attention and it is all over the jurisdiction. So in a national popular vote, which I think is the right way to elect the leader of uh, the country, the one office where you're responsible for governing everybody equally, not, not state by state, but everybody equally, that person should be chosen by a national popular vote. Thank you so much for that. And thank you, uh, audience, friends, 55 amazing questions. Let's try to get through as many of them as we can. Uh, Bill, Professor Ewald, there are several great questions about uh, constitutional history. Charles Humphreys asks, Wilson's con concept of the Electoral College was based on the prince electors of the Holy Roman Empire. Did it work, understand it changed many times over the years it ended until it ended 1800? Talk about the classical sources of Wilson's understanding of popular sovereignty. Did he say that he got the idea from Cicero and from the uh, Greeks who had some sort of theory of government by consent? Uh, he, he read uh, both uh, Cicero and also the Scottish Enlightenment theorists like Burlamachi who were readers of the classics. So tell us more about the classical sources of the greatest contribution that Wilson made to American constitutional history, which is popular sovereignty. And then we have another questioner who asks, why was there such opposition to popular election of the presidency during the convention itself? Good. Those are two, two excellent questions. So first on Wilson's sources, it's actually kind of hard to pin down exactly where the ideas come from. I suspect a lot of it is his Scottish background. Scotland was, was in the English speaking world, but, apart from kind of the American frontier where Wilson also lived, it was remarkably democratic. So that's certainly one strand in his thought. Then there is the egalitarian enlightenment looking at continental European kind of civil lawyers, looking at theoretical arguments about equality. All of that flows into his thought but saying there's one specific source, that's rather, rather difficult. Uh, great, and the opposition to popular election in the convention? Oh, well, opposition, that comes, from, that comes from numerous different sources. So one source is pretty clearly, it is the, the elitism, the idea that the people should not be entrusted with this choice. But there are other, uh, other people at the convention. So one of the more interesting is George Mason, who, who is almost as democratic as Wilson. It, he objects to the idea of a direct popular election because it would be too difficult to carry out under the circumstances of the 18th century. You didn't have modern communication, roads were bad. Most people never traveled more than, more than 10 or 15 miles from their place of birth. So under those circumstances, trying to get the people in South Carolina informed about candidates who came from Boston was just about impossible. So that was, that was one reason that I think was quite salient at the time for preferring some sort of an indirect election. That seems to have been Mason's initial objection to Wilson's proposal for a direct election. Thank you for that. 
Uh, I'm going to now ask the very first question we received, which several of you have asked in different forms. It was first asked by Steve Greenbaum. Uh, uh, what is your thought on the national popular vote interstate compact? Is this the right way to bypass the Electoral College? If not, what's the most practical way to end the Electoral College? Uh, Jesse. So the, the popular vote interstate compact it takes up chapter seven of my book. Uh, it's a fascinating story and it's a great story. Um, for those who don't know what it is, uh, it was started about 16 years ago by a computer scientist living in California named John Koza, fascinating character himself. Uh, I spent a lot of time with him trying to understand how he had developed it. Uh, he's written a 1100 page book uh, defending this uh, compact and addressing every potential misconception and every myth uh, that you've ever heard about the Electoral College in, in remarkable detail. Uh, it's one of the most compelling uh, uh, advocacy projects I've ever seen for anything, and I highly recommend it to you. You can see it on nationalpopularvote.com. You can order it there. He'll send it to you. He keeps copies. He prints it himself and keeps it in his garage <laughs> and sends it out. Um, what John Cosa created was something called, uh, it's an interstate compact. Interstate compacts are agreements among states. They're basically contracts uh, to do something, uh, say to negotiate water rights on a body of water that crosses a boundary, or um, say to create an interstate uh, lottery system. Uh, they happen all the time. States, states join them all the time. This one is an agreement among states to award all of their electors in their state to the winner, not of their statewide vote as they do today, but to the winner of the national popular vote, to the winner of the person who wins the most votes in the country. When states representing a majority of electoral votes in the country, which is 270 right now, that's what you need to become president. When states representing 270 electoral votes sign up to this compact, it takes effect automatically. And then it elects the president, it elects the candidate who wins the most votes in the country. The, the idea behind this is that that would deal with this fundamental distorting effect of the winner take all rule in the states by forcing the candidates to go get as many votes as they can nationally. If they know that they will only win by getting the most votes in the country, popular votes in the country, they will go out and try to win those votes with the strategies I spoke about earlier. Right now, 15 states have joined since uh, it was announced in early 2006, I believe. Um, 16, uh, 15 states in the District of Columbia have joined the compact. They together represent 196 electoral votes. Remember, you need 270 to win. That means 74 short of the compact taking effect. How do you get those last 74 electoral votes? Well, one thing that's unfortunate so far about the compact is that it has only been adopted by states with democratic leadership, what I think we call blue states. Um, Incidentally, I hate the term blue states and red states because uh, the whole premise of my book is that there are no blue states, there are no red states, there are only purple states. Even in states that Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton won overwhelmingly, uh, there are thousands, tens of thousands, if not millions of voters for the other party. Four and a half million people in California voted for Donald Trump in 2016. All of their votes didn't count, they didn't matter, they were essentially erased when the electors cast their ballot. So blue states only so far, or Democratic led states have ad adopted the compact. On one level, that's pretty understandable, right? Because the Democratic candidate has lost the last two elections where the Electoral College and the popular vote did not align. Um, but in fact, when you talk to the people who run the compact, and this is a bipartisan group, there's some Trump conservatives on there, there are some very strong liberals, they all work together to move this compact for the same, they, they all agree that a popular vote would be a better way to elect the president. They've actually come very close to getting it passed in Republican-led states. They've actually passed it through several Republican-led chambers in some of the states. And in 2016, they were quite close to getting it passed completely through uh, some red, red states, Republican-led states. Uh, and then the election happened and everyone sort of ran back to their partisan corners. Um, and so that was a real setback for the, for the effort. But I do think Putting aside the constitutional amendment effort, which uh, you know more than 700 times has there been an attempt to amend the constitution <laughs> in the nation's history to either get rid of or somehow change the electoral college. That's by far the most of any provision of the constitution. It really hasn't worked as we can see. This effort, the popular vote interstate compact is certainly the most elegant and uh, I think closest we've come to a, a, a radical change in how we elect the president uh, that we've seen in 50 years. Thank you for all that. 
Uh, Arnold, uh, well, first of all, I should say several of our questioners have asked, did uh, Jesse Wegman write a book? What's it called? And I'm happy to plug it again because it's uh, <laughs> you should read it. Let the people pick the president, the case for abolishing the Electoral College. A very clear Thanks, Bill. Uh, subtitle. <laughs> Although, as you noted, you, it, this was your publisher trying to pump things up a little bit. In some case, you're you're making the case for a national popular vote uh, uh, compact before abolishing the electoral college. Exactly, and that, that was one thing that was one thing I should have made very clear about this compact, which is the reason that several conservatives and uh, have joined onto it. The reason it's appealing across the board is that it actually does not abolish the electoral college. It uses the electoral college as it is designed in the Constitution, which is to say states decide for themselves how to award their electors. That is how it always has been, and that is how it is today. All this does is it says states change the way they allocate their electors. It's completely constitutional, uh, whether it's politically wise or whether it would survive uh, you know, all the legal challenges that I think will be brought is a separate question that we, we can talk about. But the bottom line is this is using the Electoral College as it is designed in the Constitution today. Thank you for that. Um, well, there are a bunch of questions about gerrymandering. And first, several of our questioners say, can you please define gerrymandering? And then August. Widmeyer asks, would a sustained effort to end gerrymandering help solve inequities in the electoral college system? So uh, thank you for the question. Defining gerrymandering, I guess it would be the, the construction of electoral districts to serve uh, specific explicit political purposes. Um, and I don't actually think that uh, ending gerrymandering would help with, with issues of, of discrepancies. Um, if, I'm sorry, was there a follow-up to the gerrymandering question? Yes, I think the, the question is, would that uh, solve some of the polarization and other questions that you note? I'll just note that as we're speaking, Mark Altman has said to August, gerrymandering is an intrastate issue. Electoral college is an interstate issue. There's no relationship between one and the other. Do you agree with Mark there? Yeah, so that's, I think uh, gerrymandering would help uh, resolve, would help, uh, ending gerrymandering would help reduce polarization because it certainly contributes to polarization, but it's not going to uh, reduce the kind of geographic polarization that I'm talking about. Um, and that is weak, essentially a reflection of weakened parties. That's great. And since it's such an important issue and you haven't had a chance to weigh in on it, do you, uh, what do you think of the proposal for an interstate compact uh, that would give the winner of the statewide election all of the electoral votes? And what would the legal challenges to it be uh, with special attention to the uh, interstate com compact clause of the constitution, which seems to require congressional endorsement of any such compacts? Do you think it would survive a legal challenge in the event that it were to pass? Should I respond? Yes, please. Thank you so much. Um, so I've, I've uh, heard and, and talked a lot about the National Popular Vote Compact. Uh, my own position is that it's a very risky and potentially dangerous enterprise. And I say this uh, as a student of uh, electoral institutions, but really as a student of democracy and how democracies endure. Um, and this is, there, there are two uh, views on how democracy can thrive. One, I would characterize as uh, democracy as a destination meaning you keep adding institutions that you think reflect your democratic principles until you get to that destination. That's not essentially, a, that's not really a view that I share. Um, the alternative is democracy as an equilibrium. And that's more in line with how I understand it. Essentially democracy being an agreement to play the rules by, uh, to play the game by a certain set of rules. And in order to maintain the balance, in order to maintain that equilibrium, you can't change the rules without changing the agreement. And that's essentially what the National Popular Vote Compact uh, promises to do. Is, and I do essentially see it as an end run around the Constitution, um, which may serve the purpose of aligning the electoral vote with the popular vote, but has much greater threat of undermining uh, democratic legitimacy. Thank you very much uh, for that. Well, I, I think this is the time for our closing statements and this completely fascinating and rich debate. Uh, Bill, Professor Ewald, uh, please share whatever concluding thoughts you had, but I will note that there are several historical questions, including several of our viewers who ask, uh, please comment on whether or not the Electoral College was originally designed to protect slavery, and do you believe it's racist today? If you, if you could uh, answer those questions and share any other concluding thoughts you have, that would be great. 
Oh, good. Well, slavery is a, it's a complex issue. For some of the framers, that does seem to have been one of their considerations in favoring an electoral college. For others, not. If you look at the people who are the principal architects towards the end of the convention, it's actually, it's a combination of George Mason, Governor Morris, Wilson, Madison. These are among the most democratic and also among the most anti-slavery members of the convention. So for them, slavery really isn't the principal point. But for others, yes, almost certainly. Um, uh, general, general reflections, I think what I'd really most like to do is echo something that Jesse said, which is the historical question needs to be sharply separated from the modern day political question. People who think that there was a deep fount of wisdom of the Constitutional Convention, uh, that really doesn't stand up to reading through all the debates. You have 50 people arguing among themselves over the course of four months. Even somebody like Wilson, who is among the two or three most consistent, he adopts four separate positions over the course of the time. In the end, they cobble the thing together. I think the title of Jesse's chapter sums it up very nicely. It was a Frankenstein creation. Whatever its merits, they need to be debated on their own. You need to look at the way that the political system operates today looking back to 1787 and hoping that that's going to solve your problems, I don't think will work. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Jesse, uh, concluding thoughts on this important question, uh, why should we abolish or come up with an alternative to the Electoral College? Well, first, I want to say that that, that term that uh, uh, Bill just quoted, the Frankenstein compromise, is something I stole from you. So. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I credit you in the book, but I just want to say that came from you and, and not my own. Uh, and that was your description of, of the Electoral College uh, that was adopted at the convention in Philadelphia. Here's what I'll say. You know, in, in writing this book, I was really trying to look at the broader arc of American history and the, and the American democratic experiment. And the thing that you see when you, when you stand back and look at it is, this, is this, that the arc is bending the whole time toward democratization toward more inclusion, toward more egalitarianism, toward a more expansive democracy, the type of democracy that I think James Wilson really um, saw more clearly than any other framer in Philadelphia. And that's why he's such a compelling figure even today. Um, you know, several of the other framers came around to his view later, uh, including Madison, including Jefferson. Uh, sorry, Jefferson's not a framer, but you know, I think we can <laughs> we can cite him as an important influence on the development of American democracy. Um, and I think what you see when you when you look at that from um, you know the the Reconstruction Amendments uh, at the end of the Civil War, which enfranchised Black people um, and and gave them the right to vote. Uh, even before that, to the expansion of voting rights um, to poorer whites and the removal of property qualifications, which were uh, you know very widespread at the time of the uh, convention, to the enfranchisement of women in the early 20th century, to the enfranchisement of 18-year-olds in the later 20th century, to the direct election of senators, also in the Progressive Era and the early 20th century, um, to the direct election of electors, which not all states used uh, at the beginning. All of these things are in the direction of more democracy, more direct inclusion of the voters, and a more expansive electorate, right? A, a broader franchise. Um, and I think the Electoral College is really the last, the last point on that arc. Uh, it is, it is, you know, something that the founders did in a hurry at the end of the convention. I don't think it has strong uh, principled or practical uh, justification. And I think it is a natural evolution of what American democracy is to have a popular vote, a direct popular vote for the president. And to me, that's the strongest argument of all. It is part of the tradition of expanding democracy that we have been watching play out slowly, fitfully, but clearly over the last 230 years. Thank you very much for that. And Amel, Ahmed, the last word is to you. Uh, why are you skeptical of efforts to abolish or come up with an alternative to the Electoral College? So I'll, I'll start by saying that, you know, let the people pick the president. Uh, Jesse, it's a wonderful book and it has such rhetorical force, the argument uh, that, that you have in there. Um, but if I can be a contrarian on one last occasion, I will just have to say that, um, 
majority rule is one of the principles guiding our constitution. It's not the only one. Minority protections are also in there. Federalism is also in there. And I'm, I, for one, value the federal dimension of our constitution and would not want to change that. The Electoral College adds that federal dimension to the office of the presidency and helps to make sure that the president is, is not completely out of whack with the rest of our governing institutions, which are um, uh, our, our federal institutions. And so that's something that I would want to preserve. That's, this is not to say that the Electoral College as it currently stands is the only way to do this, but I do think the idea of moving to a direct national popular vote for the president is dangerous. Um, and there are no uh, democracies that have long endured with direct election of the executive that haven't descended into just kind of plebiscitary government. Um, so I would be in favor of alternatives that are within the limits of the constitution and within uh, the limits of existing legislation to perhaps reduce the, the, the discrepancies between the electoral college and the popular vote. Um, but I do think there are merits to having the, the federal element preserved in the office of the presidency. Thank you so much, uh, William Ewald, Jesse Wegman, and Amel Ahmed for a truly illuminating and rich discussion of this crucially important constitutional topic. I'll echo Leslie Jones's comment that uh, it's just a superb uh, Lee educational uh, discussion and several folks have said that we could continue it for a long time. And we will, dear friends, the Constitution Center every week is hosting podcasts, town, town hall programs, live classes on the Constitution every Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday at 1 p.m. about crucial aspects of the Constitution. And all of this is free and online um, at constitutioncenter.org. Uh, so for providing a model of civil discourse in these challenging times, please join me in thanking uh, William Ewald, Jesse Wegman, and Amel Ahmed, and friends, this Great group, 600 people gathering at noontime to educate themselves at the Constitution. It is inspiring and uplifting that all of you have convened with us to learn together in the spirit of Justice Louis Brandeis. Come, let us reason together. That's just what we've done, and that's what we'll continue to do in the challenging weeks and months and years ahead. Thank you all, and keep educating yourself about the U.S. Constitution. See you soon. <laughs>